Chapter Five, Part One of Winds of Doctrine: Studies in Contemporary Opinion by George Santayana. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Five, Shelley or the Poetic Value of Revolutionary Principles, Part One. It is possible to advocate anarchy in criticism as in politics and there is perhaps nothing coercive to urge against a man who maintains that any work of art is good enough intrinsically and incommensurably if it pleased anybody at any time for any reason in practice however the ideal of anarchy is unstable irrefutable by argument it is readily overcome by nature it melts away before the dogmatic operation of the anarchist's own will as soon as he allows himself the least creative endeavour in spite of the infinite variety of what is merely possible human nature and will have a somewhat definite constitution and only what is harmonious with their actual constitution can long maintain itself in the moral world hence it is a safe principle in the criticism of art that technical proficiency and brilliancy of fancy or execution cannot avail to establish a great reputation they may dazzle for a moment but they cannot absolve an artist from the need of having an important subject matter and a sane humanity if this principle is accepted however it might seem that certain artists and perhaps the greatest might not fare well at our hands how would shelley for instance stand such a test every one knows the judgment passed on shelley by matthew arnold a critic who evidently relied on this principle even if he preferred to speak only in the name of his personal tact and literary experience shelley matthew arnold said was a beautiful and ineffectual angel beating his wings in a luminous void in vain in consequence he declared that shelley was not a classic especially as his private circle had had an unsavoury morality to be expressed only by the french word sale and as moreover shelley himself occasionally showed a distressing want of the sense of humour which could only be called bet these strictures if a bit incoherent are separately remarkably just they unmask essential weaknesses not only in shelley but in all revolutionary people the life of reason is a heritage and exists only through tradition half of it is an art an adjustment to an alien reality which only a long experience can teach and even the other half the inward inspiration and ideal of reason must be also a common inheritance in the race if people are to work together or so much as to understand one another now the misfortune of revolutionists is that they are disinherited and their folly is that they wish to be disinherited even more than they are hence in the midst of their passionate and even heroic idealisms there is commonly a strange poverty in their minds many an ugly turn in their lives and an ostentatious vileness in their manners they wish to be the leaders of mankind but they are wretched representatives of humanity in the concert of nature it is hard to keep in tune with oneself if one is out of tune with everything we should not then be yielding to any private bias but simply noting the conditions under which art may exist and may be appreciated if we accepted the classical principle of criticism and asserted that substance sanity and even a sort of pervasive wisdom are requisite for supreme works of art on the other hand who can honestly doubt it the rebels and individualists are the men of direct insight and vital hope the poetry of shelley in particular is typically poetical it is poetry divinely inspired and shelley himself is perhaps no more ineffectual or more lacking in humour than an angel properly should be nor is his greatness all a matter of aesthetic abstraction and wild music it is a fact of capital importance in the development of human genius that the great revolution in christendom against christianity a revolution that began with the renaissance and is not yet completed should have found angels to herald it no less than that other revolution did which began at bethlehem and that among these new angels there should have been one so winsome pure and rapturous as shelley how shall we reconcile these conflicting impressions 
shall we force ourselves to call the genius of shelley second-rate because it was revolutionary and shall we attribute all enthusiasm for him to literary affectation or political prejudice or shall we rather abandon the orthodox principle that an important subject matter and a sane spirit are essential to great works or shall we look for a different issue out of our perplexity by asking if the analysis and comprehension are not perhaps at fault which declare that these things are not present in shelley's poetry this last is the direction in which i conceive the truth to lie a little consideration will show us that shelley really has a great subject matter what ought to be and that he has a real humanity though it is humanity in the seed humanity in its internal principle rather than in those deformed expressions of it which can flourish in the world shelley seems hardly to have been brought up he grew up in the nursery among his young sisters at school among the rude boys without any affectionate guidance without imbibing any religious or social tradition if he received any formal training or correction he instantly rejected it inwardly set it down as unjust and absurd and turned instead to sailing paper boats to reading romances or to writing them or to watching with delight the magic of chemical experiments thus the mind of shelley was thoroughly disinherited but not like the minds of most revolutionists by accident and through the niggardliness of fortune for few revolutionists would be such if they were heirs to a baronetcy shelley's mind disinherited itself out of allegiance to itself because it was too sensitive and too highly endowed for the world into which it had descended it rejected ordinary education because it was incapable of assimilating it education is suitable to those few animals whose faculties are not completely innate animals that like most men may be perfected by experience because they are born with various imperfect alternative instincts rooted equally in their system but most animals and a few men are not of this sort they cannot be educated because they are born complete full of predeterminate intuitions they are without intelligence which is the power of seeing things as they are endowed with a specific unshakable faith they are impervious to experience and as they burst the womb they bring ready-made with them their final and only possible system of philosophy shelley was one of these spokesmen of the a priori one of these nurslings of the womb like a bee or a butterfly a dogmatic inspired perfect and incorrigible creature he was innocent and cruel swift and wayward illuminated and blind being a finished child of nature not a joint product like most of us of nature history and society he abounded miraculously in his own clear sense but was obtuse to the droll miscellaneous lessons of fortune the cannonade of hard inexplicable facts that knocks into most of us what little wisdom we have left shelley dazed and sore perhaps but uninstructed when the storm was over he began chirping again his own natural note if the world continued to confine and obsess him he hated the world and gasped for freedom being incapable of understanding reality he revelled in creating world after world in idea for his nature was not merely predetermined and obdurate it was also sensitive vehement and fertile with the soul of a bird he had the senses of a man-child the instinct of the butterfly was united in him with the instinct of the brooding fowl and of the pelican this winged spirit had a heart it darted swiftly on its appointed course neither expecting nor understanding opposition but when it met opposition it did not merely flutter and collapse it was inwardly outraged it protested proudly against fate it cried aloud for liberty and justice the consequence was that shelley having a nature preformed but at the same time tender passionate and moral was exposed to early and continual suffering when the world violated the ideal which lay so clear before his eyes that violation filled him with horror if to the irrepressible gushing of life from within we add the suffering and horror that continually checked it we shall have in hand i think the chief elements of his genius 
love of the ideal passionate apprehension of what ought to be has for its necessary counterpart condemnation of the actual wherever the actual does not conform to that ideal the spontaneous soul the soul of the child is naturally revolutionary and when the revolution fails the soul of the youth becomes naturally pessimistic all moral life and moral judgment have this deeply romantic character they venture to assert a private ideal in the face of an intractable and omnipotent world some moralists begin by feeling the attraction of untasted and ideal perfection these like plato excel in elevation and they are apt to despise rather than to reform the world other moralists begin by a revolt against the actual at some point where they find the actual particularly galling these excel in sincerity their purblind conscience is urgent and they are reformers in intent and sometimes even in action but the ideals they frame are fragmentary and shallow often mere provisional vague watchwords like liberty equality and fraternity they possess no positive visions or plans for moral life as a whole like plato's republic the utopian or visionary moralists are often rather dazed by this wicked world being well-intentioned but impotent they often take comfort in fancying that the ideal they pine for is already actually embodied on earth or is about to be embodied on earth in a decade or two or at least is embodied eternally in a sphere immediately above the earth to which we shall presently climb and be happy forever lovers of the ideal who thus hastily believe in its reality are called idealists and shelley was an idealist in almost every sense of that hard-used word he early became an idealist after berkeley's fashion and that he discredited the existence of matter and embraced a psychological or as it was called intellectual system of the universe in his drama hellas he puts this view with evident approval into the mouth of the hajuerus this whole of suns and worlds and men and beasts and flowers with all the silent or tempestuous workings by which they have been are or cease to be is but a vision all that it inherits are motes of a sick eye bubbles and dreams thought is its cradle and its grave nor less the future and the past are idle shadows of thought's eternal flight they have no being naught is but that which feels itself to be but shelley was even more deeply and constantly an idealist after the manner of plato for he regarded the good as a magnet inexplicably not working for the moment that draws all life and motion after it and he looked on the types and ideals of things as on eternal realities that subsist beautiful and untarnished when the glimmerings that reveal them to our senses have died away from the infinite potentialities of beauty in the abstract articulate mind draws certain bright forms the platonic ideas the gathered rays which are reality as shelley called them and it is the light of these ideals cast on objects of sense that lends to these objects some degree of reality and value making out of them lovely apparitions dim at first than radiant the progeny immortal of painting sculpture and rapt poesy the only kind of idealism that shelley had nothing to do with is the kind that prevails in some universities that hegelian idealism which teaches that perfect good is a vicious abstraction and maintains that all the evil that has been is and ever shall be is indispensable to make the universe as good as it possibly could be in this form idealism is simply contempt for all ideals and a hearty adoration of things as they are and as such it appeals mightily to the powers that be in church and in state but in that capacity it would have been as hateful to shelley as the powers that be always were and as the philosophy was that flattered them for his moral feeling was based on suffering and horror at what is actual no less than on love of a visioned good his conscience was to a most unusual degree at once elevated and sincere it was inspired in equal measure by prophecy and by indignation he was carried away in turn by enthusiasm for what his ethereal and fertile fancy pictured as possible and by detestation of the reality forced upon him instead 
hence that extraordinary moral fervour which is the soul of his poetry his imagination is no playful undirected kaleidoscope the images often so tenuous and metaphysical that crowd upon him are all sparks thrown off at white heat embodiments of a fervent definite unswerving inspiration if we think that the cloud or the west wind or the witch of the atlas are mere fireworks poetic dust a sort of bataille de fleurs in which we are pelted by a shower of images we have not understood the passion that overflows in them as any long-nursed passion may in any of us suddenly overflow in an unwanted profusion of words this is a point at which francis thompson's understanding of shelley generally so perfect seems to me to go astray the universe thompson tells us was shelley's box of toys he gets between the feet of the horses of the sun he stands in the lap of patient nature entwines her loosened tresses after a hundred wilful fashions to see how she will look nicest in his song this last is not i think shelley's motive it is not the truth about the spring of his genius he undoubtedly shatters the world to bits but only to build it nearer to the heart's desire only to make out of its coloured fragments some more elysian home for love or some more dazzling symbol for that infinite beauty which is the need the profound aching imperative need of the human soul this recreative impulse of the poets is not wilful as thompson calls it it is moral like the sensitive plant it loves even like love its deep heart is full it desires what it has not the beautiful the question for shelley is not at all what will look nicest in his song that is the preoccupation of mincing rhymesters whose well is soon dry shelley's abundance has a more generous source it springs from his passion for picturing what would be best not in the picture but in the world hence when he feels he has pictured or divined it he can exclaim the joy the triumph the delight the madness the boundless overflowing bursting gladness the vaporous exultation not to be confined ha ha the animation of delight which wraps me like an atmosphere of light and bears me as a cloud is borne by its own wind to match this gift of bodying forth the ideal shelley had his vehement sense of wrong and as he seized upon and recast all images of beauty to make them more perfectly beautiful so to vent his infinite horror of evil he seized on all the worst images of crime or torture that he could find and recast them so as to reach the quintessence of distilled badness his pictures of war famine lust and cruelty are or seem forced although perhaps as in the sensi he might urge that he had historical warrant for his descriptions far better historical warrant no doubt than the beauty and happiness actually to be found in the world could give him for his skylark his epipsychidion or his prometheus but to exaggerate good is to vivify to enhance our sense of moral coherence and beautiful naturalness it is to render things more graceful intelligible and congenial to the spirit which they ought to serve to aggravate evil on the contrary is to darken counsel already dark enough and the want of truth to nature in this pessimistic sort of exaggeration is not compensated for by any advantage the violence and to my feeling the wantonness of these invectives for they are invectives in intention and in effect may have seemed justified to shelley by his political purpose he was thirsting to destroy kings priests soldiers parents and heads of colleges to destroy them i mean in their official capacity and the exhibition of their vileness in all its diabolical purity might serve to remove scruples in the half-hearted we whom the nineteenth century has left so tender to historical rights and historical beauties may wonder that a poet an impassioned lover of the beautiful could have been such a leveller and such a vandal in his theoretical destructiveness but here the legacy of the eighteenth century was speaking in shelley as that of the nineteenth is speaking in us and moreover in his own person the very fertility of imagination could be a cause of blindness to the past and its contingent sanctities 
shelley was not left standing aghast like a philistine before the threatened destruction of all traditional order he had and knew he had the seeds of a far lovelier order in his own soul there he found the plan or memory of a perfect commonwealth of nature ready to rise at once on the ruins of this sad world and to make regret for it impossible so much for what i take to be the double foundation of shelley's genius a vivid love of ideal good on the one hand and on the other what is complementary to that vivid love much suffering and horror at the touch of actual evils on this double foundation he based an opinion which had the greatest influence on his poetry not merely on the subject matter of it but also on the exuberance and urgency of emotion which suffuses it this opinion was that all that caused suffering and horror in the world could be readily destroyed it was the belief in perfectibility an animal that has rigid instincts and an a priori mind is probably very imperfectly adapted to the world he comes into his organs cannot be moulded by experience and use unless they are fitted by some miraculous pre-established harmony or by natural selection to things as they are they will never be reconciled with them and an eternal war will ensue between what the animal needs loves and can understand and what the outer reality offers so long as such a creature lives and his life will be difficult and short events will continually disconcert and puzzle him everything will seem to him unaccountable inexplicable unnatural he will not be able to conceive the real order and connection of things sympathetically by assimilating his habits of thought to their habits of evolution his faculties being innate and unadaptable will not allow him to correct his presumptions and axioms he will never be able to make nature the standard of naturalness what contradicts his private impulses will seem to him to contradict reason beauty and necessity in this paradoxical situation he will probably take refuge in the conviction that what he finds to exist is an illusion or at least not a fair sample of reality being so perverse absurd and repugnant the given state of things must be he will say only accidental and temporary he will be sure that his own a priori imagination is the mirror of all the eternal proprieties and that as his mind can move only in one predetermined way things cannot be prevented from moving in that same way save by some strange violence done to their nature it would be easy therefore to set everything right again nay everything must be on the point of writing itself spontaneously wrong of its very essence must be an unstable equilibrium the conflict between what such a man feels ought to exist and what he finds actually existing must he will feel sure end by a speedy revolution in things and by the removal of all scandals that it should end by the speedy removal of his own person or by such a revolution in his demands as might reconcile him to existence will never occur to him or if the thought occurs to him it will seem too horrible to be true such a creature cannot adapt himself to things by education and consequently he cannot adapt things to himself by industry his choice lies absolutely between victory and martyrdom but at the very moment of martyrdom martyrs as is well known usually feel assured of victory the a priori spirit will therefore be always a prophet of victory so long as it subsists at all the vision of a better world at hand absorbed the israelites in exile st john the baptist in the desert and christ on the cross the martyred spirit always says to the world it leaves this day thou shalt be with me in paradise in just this way shelley believed in perfectibility in his latest poems in hellas and adonais he was perhaps a little inclined to remove the scene of perfectibility to a metaphysical region as the christian church soon removed it to the other world indeed an earth really made perfect is hardly distinguishable from a posthumous heaven so profoundly must everything in it be changed and so angel-like must every one in it become shelley's earthly paradise as described in prometheus and in epipsychidion is too festival-like too much of a mere culmination not to be fugitive it cries aloud to be translated into a changeless and metaphysical heaven 
which to shelley's mind could be nothing but the realm of platonic ideas where life like a dome of many-coloured glass no longer stains the white radiance of eternity but the age had been an age of revolution and in spite of disappointments retained its faith in revolution and the young shelley was not satisfied with a paradise removed to the intangible realms of poetry or of religion he hoped like the old hebrews for a paradise on earth his notion was that eloquence could change the heart of man and that love kindled there by the force of reason and of example would transform society he believed mrs shelley tells us that mankind had only to will that there should be no evil and there would be none and she adds that man could be so perfectionized as to be able to expel evil from his own nature and from the greater part of creation was the cardinal point of his system this cosmic extension of the conversion of men reminds one of the cosmic extension of the fall conceived by st augustine and in the prometheus shelley has allowed his fancy half in symbol half in glorious physical hyperbole to carry the warm contagion of love into the very bowels of the earth and even the moon by reflection to catch the light of love and be alive again shelley we may safely say did not understand the real constitution of nature it was hidden from him by a cloud all woven of shifting rainbows and bright tears only his emotional haste made it possible for him to entertain such opinions as he did entertain or rather it was inevitable that the mechanism of nature as it is in its depths should remain in his pictures only the shadowiest of backgrounds his poetry is accordingly a part of the poetry of illusion the poetry of truth if we have the courage to hope for such a thing is reserved for far different and yet unborn poets but it is only fair to shelley to remember that the moral being of mankind is as yet in its childhood all poets play with images not understood they touch on emotions sharply at random as in a dream they suffer each successive vision each poignant sentiment to evaporate into nothing or to leave behind only a heart vaguely softened and fatigued a gentle languor or a tearful hope every modern school of poets once out of fashion proves itself to have been sadly romantic and sentimental none has done better than to spangle a confused sensuous pageant with some sparks of truth or to give it some symbolic relation to moral experience and this shelley has done as well as anybody all other poets also have been poets of illusion the distinction of shelley is that his illusions are so wonderfully fine subtle and palpitating that they betray passions and mental habits so singularly generous and pure and why because he did not believe in the necessity of what is vulgar and did not pay that demoralizing respect to it under the title of fact or of custom which it exacts from most of us the past seemed to him no valid precedent the present no final instance as he believed in the imminence of an overturn that should make all things new he was not checked by any divided allegiance by any sense that he was straying into the vapid or fanciful when he created what he justly calls beautiful idealisms of moral excellence that is what his poems are fundamentally the skylark and the witch of the atlas and the sensitive plant no less than the grander pieces he infused into his gossamer world the strength of his heroic conscience he felt that what his imagination pictured was a true symbol of what human experience should and might pass into otherwise he would have been aware of playing with idle images his poetry would have been mere millinery and his politics mere business he would have been a worldling in art and in morals the clear fire the sustained breath the fervent accent of his poetry are due to his faith in his philosophy as mrs shelley expressed it he had no care for any of his poems that did not emanate from the depths of his mind and develop some high and abstruse truth had his poetry not dealt with what was supreme in his own eyes and dearest to his heart it could never have been the exquisite and entrancing poetry that it is it would not have had an adequate subject matter as in spite of matthew arnold i think it had for nothing can be empty that contains such a soul an angel cannot be ineffectual if the standard of efficiency is moral 
he is what all others bring about when they are effectual and a void that is alive with the beating of luminous wings and of a luminous heart is quite sufficiently peopled shelley's mind was angelic not merely in its purity and fervour but also in its moral authority in its prophetic strain what was conscious in his generation was life in him end of chapter five part one recording by expatriate in bangor maine